Samurai Jack is one of the most unique, ambitious, and loved cartoons that Cartoon Network has ever created. In the early 2000s, Cartoon Network had the golden touch, coming out cartoon classic after cartoon classic. When it came time to air Samurai Jack, as we all know, they hit another home run. I guess when you greenlight a show from a creator who was heavily involved with Dexter's Lab and the Powerpuff Girls, you'd expect nothing less. Throughout its five sword-swinging seasons, Samurai Jack takes place in a fictional kingdom of Japan, which has been taken over by Aku, a horrifically evil, shape-shifting demon who was born from pure darkness. Nice and light for a kid's cartoon. And the only person capable of beating him? is of course the prince of the kingdom, Samurai Jack. Jack is a supremely skilled samurai who wields a magical katana which was divinely crafted to defeat Aku. Jack's father years before failed to fully defeat the all-powerful demon, so now it's up to Jack to avenge his father. This leads to an epic showdown with Aku, where Jack almost beats him. But before he could land the final blow, Aku tore open a portal in time. <coughs> Sorry and sends Jack spiraling into a future world where Aku's evil is law. Now trapped in the future, Jack must find a way back to the past to undo Aku's evil, saving his kingdom and the world. Now that's what I call a premise to a cartoon. I think that's the need to know is covered. But of course, as usual, there's a lot more to learn along the way. And don't forget to slice, dice, and smash that subscribe button. Now, let's get into a full recap of Samurai Jack. The first episode of the series, believe it or not, is called The Beginning. And it starts with a powerful solar eclipse that has a strange effect on what appears to be a warped dead tree in the middle of the Japanese wasteland. Springing out of the ground, the tree grows into a tall, dark figure with flaming eyebrows. It's none other than the ancient evil demon, Aku. He states that once again he is free to smite the world as he once did long ago. I am free to smite the world as I did in days long past. Nearby, an emperor of a Japanese kingdom tells his son about a war he fought against an evil shape-shifting demon called Aku. Boy, is he in for a surprise. He continues to explain that Aku arose from the pit of hate to ravage the land back when he was a newly crowned emperor. On his own, he was helpless against Aku. However, he remembered a tale that he had heard from his great-grandfather about three monks gifted with mystical powers. The emperor rode to the highest peak of the mountainside, where the monks agreed to forge a magical sword for him. Armed with the sword, he battled Aku and defeated him and planting him into the very wasteland he created in the form of the same black tree we just saw him rise from. Impressed by the tale, the young prince begins to play with a wooden sword, when all of a sudden, a great shadow falls over the land. It's Aku. <laughs> and he forces his way through the palace wall. The army tries to fight him off using arrows, javelins, and catapults, but to no avail, as Aku absorbs their weapons and fires them back at the Emperor's army. The Emperor is then kidnapped by Aku before he can fetch his magical sword, only managing to say a few words to his wife, the Empress. He tells her to do as they planned if the ancient evil of Aku should ever return. So she grabs the young prince and the sword, carrying them away from the burning palace by boat, while Aku laughs victoriously over the destruction of his former slayer's empire. The Empress hands the prince over to the captain of a ship which bears the emblem of his father, while the sword stays with her. The prince spends his childhood and teenage years in various cultures, readying the young prince for a life of travel, hardship, and battle. The prince trains within the cultures of the world, gaining various skills and knowledge before finally training with the sword, before he is ready to return home and free his people. Meanwhile, the people of his land are enslaved, the countryside is riddled with likenesses of Aku, and the Emperor, like all his subjects, has been put to work in the mines. But before the Emperor is about to be punished, the Prince arrives and battles Aku's minions, defeating them with ease and freeing his father. The Emperor tells his son that Aku means to use the riches found in the mines to strengthen his powers and take over the entire world. The Prince promises that he will vanquish Aku by the power of his sword, but his father berates him, saying the sword is only a tool and that the true power lies in the hands that wield it. 
The prince leaves and heads for Aku's tower. Aku! Aku rises from his lair and meets the prince. Aku sees the prince's sword and boasts that no mortal weapon can harm him. But the prince strikes Aku, dealing damage to him. Enough damage for Aku to remember the sword. But he still laughs at it, as it didn't slay him forever. And he thinks neither the prince, his father, or the magical sword have the powers to do so. With those words, Aku decides to battle the prince and shapeshifts into the form of a large gorilla. Aku attacks the prince, and an all-out battle takes place where Aku takes many forms to try and defeat his foe. But for every form, the prince strikes back. Having the upper hand, the prince then prepares to finish Aku and throws his sword into the air, piercing him and trapping him within the sword. Aku is reduced into a shadow that lies defeated before the prince and tells him that he may have been defeated now, but in the future it'll be very different. The prince exclaims that there is no future for Aku, but he disagrees, as with a sonic screech, Aku tears open a portal in time through which the prince is flung into the distant future, where Aku is the supreme leader of the planet, and his evil is law. Aku promises they will meet again, but next time, he will destroy the prince once and for all. The next episode of the series is called The Samurai Called Jack, and it picks up where the first episode left off. With the prince finally escaping the portal Aku had thrown him into, only to find himself falling into the depths of a high-tech city and nearly getting hit by flying cars. After managing to land on one of the vehicles, the prince is shot at by a car, but he quickly cuts the car apart and lands safely on the ground below by jumping from car to car. The prince soon finds himself facing a massive trash-compacting vehicle heading straight for him, but he manages to avoid getting crushed using his acrobatic skills and then climbing on the vehicle's underside, leaping onto a walkway where three young aliens had been watching him. Amazed by his skills, the three continually refer to him as Jack. The prince asks him where he is and who's in charge. They tell the prince that Aku is their leader, which causes the prince to frantically look around, becoming overwhelmed by the fact that Aku is everywhere. The teens then direct him to a bar so that he can get a drink and calm his nerves. At the bar, the prince is astonished to see that everyone inside is an alien. He gets into a misunderstanding type fight with one of the aliens, and while the prince is defending himself, three canine archaeologists are speaking with an alien warrior, hoping he will help them fight against Aku. But their request is denied because, well, who would want to take on a super evil shape-shifting demon? The three then turn to the prince after watching him battle to see if he'll help them. They introduce themselves as Sir Dreyfus Alexander, Sir Angus McDuffie, and Sir Colin Bartholomew Montgomery Rothschild III. How very fancy indeed. They explain to the prince that Aku has ruled the earth for thousands of years, while extending his reach towards other galaxies to increase his wealth and power over resources, causing a deluge of life forms to inhabit earth and change it into what it is now. They quickly discover that the prince is in fact from the past after he points out the fact that where he came from, dogs only barked. What do you mean? After scanning him, they discover that he originates from the time before Aku took over Earth completely. The prince himself understands and realizes that the question is not where he is, but when, and that Aku must have thrown him into the future. The dogs then ask the prince for his help to free them and their colleagues from Aku, who has enslaved them to work in crystal mines without rest, making them unable to continue their studies about their past. The prince decides to help them and introduces himself, for the very first time, as Jack. They call me Jack. As they leave, unbeknownst to them, a spy of Aku's overheard their conversation, and as soon as he hears the information, Aku becomes infuriated and wishes to see who would dare oppose him, only to discover that it was, after all this time, Jack. Aku knew this day would come and proclaims that Jack will now suffer the pain he felt in the past and sends an army of beetle drones to attack him and the archaeologists. At the excavation site, Jack and the archaeologists learn that Aku has sent an army of machines to destroy them, so they must prepare for their first ever battle in the future. Continuing from episode 2, the third episode of the series, The First Fight, 
starts with Jack setting up a layer of traps to thin out the army of beetle drones. While the archaeologists set up the traps, Jack looks for items that can be used as weapons. He finds out that the very jewels Aku had been forcing the archaeologists to dig up can be used as weapons. So, he makes them into spears and arrows for a bow. With the trap set, the archaeologists create armor for Jack as he tames one of the animals to use in battle. As the sun rises, the beetle drones enter the valley, so Jack heads out to face them, activating the first trap, catapults made from digging machines. He fires his arrows at each of the start buttons of the machines, causing them to fire stones into the middle of the army, destroying several beetle drones. He activates trap after trap, destroying a large portion of Aku's army, but once his traps have run out of ammo, Jack begins using the spears he made and manages to destroy a few more drones before being knocked off his steed. Left alone on the battlefield, Jack draws his sword and begins fighting, but is quickly overwhelmed and stripped of his armor. Jack manages to get away from the drones and leads them to a secret section of traps. He quickly knocks them over, causing a rock slide that destroys more drones, as well as creating a walkway to the next hidden trap, spaceships made into flamethrowers. He ignites them and destroys several more drones before they run out of fuel. Jack leads the drones to their last trap, a spike pit made using the jewels, and jumps over the pit, leading the drones to fall into the pit, drastically cutting their numbers. Unfortunately, it doesn't get enough of them, as Jack is still immensely outnumbered, and now all out of traps. Left without any other strategy at his disposal, Jack decides to fight with only his sword. The drones keep coming, injuring Jack with their blades while he destroys as many as he can. Scarred from the drone's attack, Jack rips off the top of his G and continues to fight. Now covered from head to toe in their black oil, Jack stares at the remaining drones, who have become terrified at the sight of the samurai covered in the oil of their fallen brethren and slowly start to step away. However, there is no escape, and Jack begins to destroy the last few drones until there are no more. With the drones destroyed, the archaeologists are freed and can continue their studies of the past. They offer Jack a chance to travel with them, but he declines and decides to embark on a journey to find a way back in time to right Aku's wrongs. Aku, who has been watching the battle the whole time, promises Jack, and refers to him by name for this time, that he will destroy him. The next episode starts in a forest, with Jack setting up a clever trap with a carrot as bait to catch a warthog. However, the tranquility is disrupted when a rumbling vibration and distant roar startles the warthog away. Four colossal furry creatures known as the Woolies arrive on the scene, with small advanced beings riding on their backs. Chaos ensues as Jack unintentionally gets ensnared by one of the Woolies, but he manages to turn the tables and capture it instead. The advanced beings invite Jack back to their village, where they celebrate the capture of the Woolly, displaying a mix of technology and tradition. Jack observes the treatment of the Woolies, who are coerced into performing stunts similar to a circus and punished with electric tritons if they fail. He expresses concern about their harsh treatment, but the beings justify it by comparing it to how humans treat horses. During the night, Jack is stirred by just how out of place the ancient village structures are and decides to investigate further. This curiosity leads him to the imprisoned Woolly, who surprisingly speaks perfect human English and pleads for help. However, their interaction is abruptly interrupted with the advanced beings appear and electrocute the captive Wooly, warning Jack about the Wooly's alleged mind control abilities. In a subsequent dream, Jack encounters a magical gate and confronts imp-like creatures. The captive Wooly reappears, seeking assistance. Upon waking, Jack frees the Wooly from a magical orb's grasp and learns about the tragic history of the Woolies. They were once a peaceful, civilized race until the arrival of the Critchalites, who enslaved them using advanced technology and subjected them to decades of oppression. Jack agrees to aid the Woolies, prompting a daring mission to destroy the orb and free the creatures. He makes short work of destroying the orb, and now with the freed Woolies by his side, they confront the Critchalites, tricking them into releasing the captive Woolies and engaging in a fierce battle. Grateful for his help, the Woolies, led by the wise elder Lazor, offer to assist Jack in his quest, guiding him towards a mysterious magical land that holds the key to his destiny. The episode The Scotsman introduces us to a beloved character of the same name, 
The Scotsman is a loud and proud warrior with a metal machine gun leg, and in his first appearance isn't so friendly to our favorite samurai. Huh? You think I'm dumb too? The episode starts to unfold with Jack as he traverses mist-covered hills and encounters a lengthy bridge. After a day of travel, he's disturbed by the cacophonous melodies emanating from the Scotsman's bagpipes. Jack politely asks for a pause in the music and asks where the bridges end. Jack quickly learns that the Scotsman has been on this journey for days. Jack requests passage, but the stubborn Scotsman refuses, sparking a heated argument about rudeness and equality. And despite Jack's attempts to defuse the situation, the Scotsman insists on settling the dispute through combat. As the duel escalates, insults fly, including jabs at Jack's attire and weaponry. The fight rages on until the arrival of unexpected bounty hunters, who shackle the bickering warriors together. Jack cleverly sabotages the bridge, plunging them into a marsh below, destroying the hunters' vehicles, and enabling their escape. They eventually reach an abandoned settlement, where the Scotsman discovers a wanted poster of Jack. When the bounty hunters return, the pair fight back, but struggle due to their newly found camaraderie. A discussion begins and they exploit an opportunity to break free from their shackles by leaping between a giant bullet. They easily defeat their foes, leading to mutual respect, but also a rivalry sparked by each insisting on buying the other a drink. Thus, their unique friendship and rivalry are born. This may be the first time we see the Scotsman, but it certainly won't be the last. The next episode, Jack Learns to Jump Good, begins with Jack attempting to reach another time portal, destroying a swarm of beetle drones in the process. Just as he gets close, however, Aku appears and takes the portal out of Jack's reach. The samurai tries to jump for the portal, but Aku tauntingly moves it just out of range before transforming into a bird and flying away with the portal. Later, while traveling through a forest, Jack comes across a wild man whose exceptional jumping abilities almost make it seem like he can fly. But he doesn't fly. He jumps good. After discussing the samurai's recent troubles, the man takes Jack to meet his tribe, who will teach him to jump as well as he can. Upon reaching the tribe, he, Jack discovers it is a tribe of white and blue apes who raised the man from a young age. Their ability to jump good helps them traverse the forest home and evade their enemies such as the tribe of larger red apes that suddenly attacks in an attempt to steal their food. But Jack won't stand for bullying, so goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the aggressive tribe. After Jack defeats the rival tribe, he offers to teach the blue apes how to defend themselves in exchange for them teaching him how to jump good. Jack proceeds to show the tribe how to make and set traps, as well as how to wield a staff. In exchange, the monkeys then attach very heavy rocks to Jack and make him perform various exercises, in order to strengthen his muscles to be able to jump high. Once he has mastered the exercises, Jack removes the rocks and discovers that he can leap effortlessly into the air. He thanks his monkey man friend and leaves. Later, the rival tribe returns and the monkey man leads his tribe against the attackers. Hearing the noise, Jack returns, only to discover the tribe has defeated their attackers. Warning the apes never to come back, the monkey man signals his tribe to catapult them away. Jack smiles, satisfied that his work is done. Jack then battles and defeats more of Aku's beetle drones and approaches the time portal once more. As before, Aku appears and lifts the portal up into the air, but Jack simply leaps up with his sword drawn. A stunned Aku exclaims, You can fly? But Jack simply answers, No, jump good. The next episode begins with glimpses of a wanted poster of Jack being the most wanted man in the future, who happens to be eating noodles in a tavern full of bounty hunters. After the bounty hunters confirm Jack's identity from the poster, they begin to attack him. Fortunately for Jack, the Scotsman arrives, blowing up the tavern with the bounty hunters still inside. Once outside, the Scotsman explains he tracked down Jack to ask him for help. A clan of Celtic demons had kidnapped his beloved wife, and the Scotsman is forbidden by ancient tradition to be aided by his clan members. The only loophole allows the Scotsman to seek aid from a stranger, and in his words, Jack is the strongest man the Scotsman knows. So of course, Jack agrees to help. But first, he has to gain the approval of the Scotsman clan. The two friends travel to the Highlands, where Jack is introduced to the Scotsman's clan, including the clan's druid, 
After passing a test of strength, Jack and the Scotsman are allowed to go rescue his wife. After sneaking into the castle of Boone, where the Celtic demons reside, the two discover that the demons want to eat the Scotsman's wife by cooking her in a soup. They finally reach the tower where the Scotsman's wife is being kept, only for Jack to learn that she is even more abrasive than her husband. Nevertheless, this seems to please the Scotsman, who smiles at her rude remarks about himself and Jack. As they try to sneak her out, the trio are cornered by the demon horde. Though the two warriors fight bravely, they are vastly outnumbered and on the verge of defeat. However, when the master of the hunt refers to the Scotsman's wife as the fat one, she grows infuriated, sending her into a frenzied rage and destroying the entire horde with her bare hands while Jack and the Scotsman stare in awe. With the demons dealt with, the Scotsman's wife decides it's time to head for home. Jack then commends her for her intense fighting skill and superhuman strength, and she politely remarks that he's not as bad as she first thought. Though, he could use a bit of haggis to fatten him up. As the three begin to leave, Jack realizes that the main doorway is too small for the Scotsman's wife, indirectly implying that she is fat and forcing him to flee as she furiously chases him in another fit of rage, with the Scotsman calling after her not to squash his best friend. The episode, Jack Remembers the Past, opens with Jack soaring on a giant flying insect, pursued by robotic feline creatures known as Cossacks. These mechanical foes, dressed as cavalry, shoot laser spheres at Jack, who outwits most of them before counterattacking with his magic sword. His ride lands, leaving only one Cossack standing with a lance. So Jack engages in a joust, easily defeating the final foe, causing it to explode. After his victory, Jack is welcomed by small robed beings resembling raccoons, grateful for freeing them from the Cossack tyranny. Jack is thanked and bows in return before continuing his quest. His journey takes him through various terrains, including a bronze-colored grassland, a desert, and perilous mountains. He encounters a seemingly impassable gap but perseveres through extreme cold and finally reaches more temperate surroundings by a beautiful river. Here he reflects upon his reflection and discovers a weathered statue. Jack rings an ancient bell, revealing the symbol of his homeland. Shocked to find his homeland in ruins, he reminisces about its former glory, leading to a heartfelt moment of tears. In a flashback, young Jack plays with a girl in a field sharing their pursuit of grasshoppers. Their playful bonding ends with a kiss on the cheek from the girl. Jack then remembers a bridge from his childhood where a ronin samurai and his son encounter shadowy figures, leading to a swift and skillful battle. Young Jack watches in awe, and this experience influences his own swordsmanship. Suddenly, a small robot in distress interrupts Jack's reminiscing. It begs for help, revealing its village is under attack. Jack prepares to assist, ending the episode with a glimpse of his parents, seemingly proud of the man he has become in their absence. The episode Jack and the Monks begins on a rainy day, Jack mid-battle with a horde of Aku's robots, striving to reach a time portal that can take him back to his era. Despite defeating the robots, the portal is destroyed, leaving Jack disheartened and furious. A sudden gust of wind snatches his hat, leading him to chase it down only to have it caught by three mysterious monks. Jack politely asks for his hat back, and the monks oblige. By the way, how creepy are these guys anyway? Curious about their destination, Jack inquires where they're headed, and they gesture to a massive mountain. When asked what they seek at the mountain's peak, the monks respond with truth, and hint at a greater power that dwells there, a summit unconquered. Intrigued by this challenge, or the potential power, Jack decides to join the monks on their quest, but the ascent proves perilous, with goatmen, rock monsters, and freezing temperatures testing Jack's endurance, which the monks seem to handle effortlessly. During a snowstorm, Jack becomes separated from the monks and is attacked by a Sasquatch-like creature. Despite being battered, he defeats the creature by crushing it with an icicle. Exhausted, he struggles to continue and collapses in despair, muttering, It is impossible. Suddenly, visions of his enslaved family and home flash before Jack's eyes, reminding him of his purpose and the desperate plight of his people. His determination reignites, and he forges ahead until reaching the summit. There, he finds only a view of the horizon, but he understands the true game, a renewed sense of purpose. 
Jack expresses gratitude to the monks and defiantly shouts to Aku across the horizon that he will never give up and will return to the past to destroy him. The episode Jack and the Spartans is perhaps the most iconic episode in all of the show's history, so get ready, this one will knock your samurai socks off. The episode begins with Jack scaling a mountain and discovering a narrow passage to continue his journey. Emerging on the other side, he witnesses a fierce battle near a tight corridor, where around 300 Spartans confront mechanical minotaurs. Jack, observing from a distance, leaps in to aid the surrounded warriors, easily dispatching the remaining foes. The robots retreat, dragging their fallen comrades. Jack believes they've won, but the Spartan Prince reveals they haven't truly triumphed, as the robots will return. Jack then meets the Spartan General and King, explaining that he intervened to assist an outnumbered comrade in battle. Realizing Jack is an ally, the King details the dire situation. A mechanical creature resembling an octopus has devastated the land, growing stronger by consuming it, and now targets the Spartan Kingdom. The creature sends robotic troops to capture the kingdom, but a narrow ravine acts as the only entrance, defended fiercely by the Spartans. For generations they've battled the bots, pushing them back each time, but the constant warfare drains their strength. The Spartans fear the robots will eventually overcome them. However, Jack reveals a pass through the mountains that could lead to an attack on the monster's base. Inspired by this, the king plans for his son to stay and defend, while he, Jack, and a group of men launch a final assault on the robotic monster. The next day, they infiltrate the stronghold to engage the monster in battle and critically wound it. Jack sacrifices himself, seemingly dying in the ensuing explosion. Years later, the king lies on his deathbed, recounting the heroic tale to his people, including his now happily married son, who has become a father. They remember Jack and the 300 Spartans, but the king believes Jack didn't perish in the explosion, as a warrior of his caliber couldn't be defeated so easily. The story ends with Jack's silhouette amid the smoke of the destroyed fortress. He's alive! In the next episode, the story begins with Jack navigating a perilous jungle plagued by incessant itching caused by swarming, biting insects hidden within his robe. After brushing the insects away, he senses a presence and is suddenly ambushed by two Shaolin monks. Both sides, baffled by the other's attire and martial art prowess, engage in a battle of wits and skills. They verbally announce their techniques and counter each other's moves in a dazzling display of combat. The monks are astonished by Jack's knowledge of their techniques and declare it impossible for him to be a Shaolin since their order has remained secluded for centuries. To prove his claims, Jack and the monks demonstrate various martial art styles, including Mantis, Southern Fist, Eagle Claw, and Water Beetle. As a final test, the monks ask if Jack knows the principal secret sign of the Shaolin, which he performs correctly. Having confirmed his authenticity, the monks rejoice and decide to inform the Grand Master. They reveal a hidden passage to their temple, and Jack enters to find numerous monks practicing and meditating. He is impressed by the temple's endurance over centuries, thanks in part to the Grand Master's mastery of martial arts and chi manipulation, allowing some advanced students to perform seemingly supernatural feats. Jack finally meets the Grand Master, a centuries-old man whose body has become intertwined with a tree, frozen in a meditative state. Jack introduces himself as a pupil of Master Chu, and the Grand Master reveals he was also Chu's pupil in his childhood when Jack was training to battle Aku. The Grand Master's Chi became immensely powerful, sustaining him for centuries with nature's help. He acknowledges Jack's long life, but senses his anxiety, as Aku constantly surveils him. However, the temple remains shielded from Aku's watchful eye. Seeking a portal to the past, the Grand Master informs Jack of another mystical temple far to the north, with a portal that only opens for a few moments at noon when the sun is directly overhead. Two monks volunteer to guide Jack, and they set out, armed with a broadsword and staff. After a challenging journey, they reach the massive vertical temple complex. As they ascend, they sense danger but dismiss it and continue. But then, stone guardians emerge from the mountain and attack. The trio fight their way up, but as the sun nears its zenith, the monks decide to hold off the guardian army, allowing Jack to reach the portal. Jack rushes towards the chamber containing the active portal as the monks fight valiantly, their weapons breaking and skills outmatched. Faced with a difficult decision, Jack chooses to help the monks rather than going through the portal, 
realizing he cannot sacrifice their lives for his return to the past. In a flash of light, the portal's energy vanishes, and the monks, believing Jack succeeded, prepare to meet their fate with honor. However, Jack reappears, striking down the remaining guardians and ordering the monks inside. They escape as the temple collapses, but the monks are puzzled as to why Jack aided them, relinquishing his chance to return to the past. Jack explains that he was not willing to sacrifice everything, and with the portal destroyed, he must find a new way back. It's time for another two-parter. The first half of the Double Bill episode, The Birth of Evil, starts in the depths of space. A colossal void of darkness threatens to engulf the entire universe. In response to this dire threat, three ancient gods emerge from a nearby star, Odin, the king of the Norse gods, Ra, the sun god of what would later become ancient Egypt, and Rama, an avatar of Vishnu, one of the supreme deities of Hinduism. Together, they engage the dark mass in a fierce battle, wielding their divine powers and weapons to combat the encroaching darkness. After a relentless struggle, the three gods succeed in vanquishing the dark void, seemingly putting an end to the cosmic menace. However, one small fragment of the malevolent force survives and drifts through the cosmos, eventually finding its way to Earth. This fragment crash lands on Earth, precisely where Japan's islands would later form. The fragment, a pool of tar-like black liquid, settles within a massive crater, absorbing the remnants of the dinosaurs and sprouting jagged, tree-like spikes as it seeks to spread its influence. Over time, this ominous pool continues to grow and expand, posing a dire threat to all life. As Japan's monarchy is established, the forest of ominous spike encroaches upon civilization, impaling homes and buildings dangerously close to the imperial palace. Recognizing the grave danger to his lands and people, the emperor, with a heavy heart, makes the agonizing decision to confront the menace at its core. Despite his pregnant wife's desperate pleas for him to stay, the emperor is driven by the belief that the people of his land are also his family. He embarks on a perilous mission, armed with a deadly elixir of poison that is believed to hold the key to defeating the Dark Pool once and for all. Accompanied by an elite cavalry unit, the Emperor ventures into the ominous forest, determined to reach the heart of the Dark Pool. As they journey deeper into the forest, the ground starts to tremble and the spikes erupt from the earth, killing all of the Emperor's men. Undeterred, he presses forward until he reaches the very center of the forest. There, with the black pool expanding ominously before him, the Emperor takes an arrow and dips it into the elixir of poison. Reciting a mystical chant, he fires the arrow into the sky, where it ignites from the sun's rays before piercing the heart of the pool. Initially, it seems that the Emperor's plan has succeeded, as the spikes begin to retract into the pool. However, a dreadful revelation dawns upon him. The elixir has not destroyed the darkness, but granted it life. This is the birth of Aku. Aku, meaning evil in Japanese, has been unleashed into the world. As Aku takes a moment to acclimate to his newfound form, he notices the emperor on the ground and ironically thanks him for his release. In a fit of rage, the emperor attempts to slay Aku for his unintended creation, but his efforts prove futile. Aku absorbs the arrows fired at him and melts the Emperor's sword with ease. Proclaiming his immunity to mortal weapons, Aku punishes the Emperor for his defiance. The pool's remaining sludge rises and engulfs the Emperor, binding him to a colossal tree that is sprouted from the darkness. With his adversary subdued, Aku descends upon the Emperor's homeland, leaving the devastated ruler to watch helplessly as the monster he inadvertently brought into existence begins its destructive rampage laying waste to his once proud kingdom. That's one hell of a cliffhanger. <laughs> Get it? Continuing straight on to part two of The Birth of Evil, Aku continues his devastating rampage. The emperor is left helpless and snared on a dark tree. In this dire moment, hope arrives in the form of Odin's magnificent white horse. The loyal steed frees the emperor from his entrapment, carrying him to a towering mountain peak where he encounters three formidable gods, Ra, Vishnu, and Odin. In a solemn meeting with these divine beings, the Emperor gains a profound understanding of what Aku truly is. The gods take the pure spirit from him, and assuming the guise of three monks, they skillfully forge this essence into an enchanted sword of immense power. 
Now armed with his divine weapon and clad in gleaming silver armor, the Emperor embarks on a resolute journey to back to confront Aku. Riding upon a mystical cloud, he charges into battle with renewed determination. Aku, however, merely laughs at the Emperor's efforts, confident in his invulnerability to mortal weaponry. Undeterred, the Emperor brandishes the enchanted sword and strikes Aku, causing the evil demon genuine harm and confusion. The Emperor skillfully dodges the lethal beams Aku fires his way and lands another powerful strike on Aku's form. In retaliation, Aku transforms into a formidable flying dragon, relentlessly pursuing the Emperor through the skies. A thrilling aerial chase between the two rages on, with the Emperor skillfully avoiding Aku's attacks. Eventually, the Emperor lands a decisive blow, severing Aku's head from his body. Yet, even decapitated, Aku remains a formidable adversary. Morphing into the shape of a menacing spider, Aku strikes the Emperor, knocking him away. Aku then erupts into a cascade of black goo, reforming himself into an army, each soldier composed of his dark substance. The Emperor finds himself surrounded by this nightmarish legion. An intense standoff, both the Emperor and the Aku soldiers exchange glares. Displaying remarkable prowess with his enchanted sword, the Emperor systematically cuts down each soldier until only one remains. As Aku attempts to flee in terror, the Emperor takes decisive action, thrusting the enchanted sword into him. Aku is ensnared within the sword's magical confines, and the Emperor plunges the blade into the earth, transforming Aku into a colossal craggy tree. Despite his defeat, Aku vows to return one day. With Aku seemingly vanquished, the Emperor returns to his beloved wife, drawn by the cry of their newborn son. Holding his child, the Emperor knows that they must plan for the possibility of Aku's return, ensuring the safety of their family and kingdom in the face of future challenges. Well, if you enjoyed that two-parter, then you're in luck, as we've got another one coming your way. The episode The Scotsman Saves Jack begins with the Scotsman enjoying the sun on board a ship. A bounty hunter attempts to ambush him, only to be swiftly dispatched with a single punch. After this encounter, the Scotsman, in his usual boisterous manner, demands a drink from a waiter on the ship. However, his excitement turns to astonishment when he recognizes the waiter's uncanny resemblance to his friend and comrade, Samurai Jack. Although the waiter, who introduces himself as Brent Worthington, behaves and dresses differently. Eager to reconnect with his old friend, the Scotsman initiates a conversation with Brent, attempting to reminisce about their shared adventures. To his bewilderment, Brent seems oblivious to their past and insists on his identity as Brent. The Scotsman initially believes Jack is playing a prank, but grows increasingly concerned when Brent denies carrying a sword and expresses a belief in non-violence. Desperate to jog Brent's memory, the Scotsman loudly recounts Jack's heroic deeds, his reputation, and the bounty placed on his head by Aku. This spectacle attracts the attention of other bounty hunters on the ship, whom the Scotsman asks to confirm Brent's identity. One of the hunters, the largest among them, validates that Brent is indeed the waiter, prompting the Scotsman to punch Brent into a pile of crates, hoping it would restore his memory. Instead, it leaves Brent unconscious. The Scotsman then jumps into battle to fend off the bounty hunters. He then grabs the unconscious Brent and, after tossing a grenade, escapes from the ship by jumping into the sea, swimming with Brent on his back. As Brent regains consciousness, confused about how he ended up in the ocean, Soon, they find themselves surrounded by fishmen riding giant fish. While the Scotsman prepares for a fight, Brent is able to translate the fishmen's speech and reveals that they are not hostile. Jack had previously come to their undersea kingdom's aid when it was under attack by Aku's minions, leaving before they could properly thank him. The fishmen express their gratitude to Brent, despite his assistance that he is not the hero who saved them. The Scotsman, however, remains convinced that Brent is an amnesiac Jack as they continue swimming. Upon reaching the shore of an island, Brent thanks the Scotsman for saving him and intends to continue on his way. Unwilling to abandon his friend, the Scotsman insists on helping Brent recover his memories and sword. The Scotsman notices a fresh scar on Brent's chest. He knows it as the mark left by the Tango Beast and decides to use it as a clue to guide him. Their journey leads them to the lair of the Tango Beast, but Brent insists that nothing seems familiar to him and denies being a legendary samurai hero. 
The Scotsman believes that reenacting Jack's previous encounter with the Tango Beast might trigger Brent's memories. He uses the scent of the wily Jubjub plant, known to infuriate the beast, and successfully provokes it. The Tango Beast reveals that Jack had fought and defeated him, subsequently helping him overcome his self-esteem issues and get his life back on track. The Scotsman inquires about Jack's whereabouts after their encounter and follows the Tango Beast's directions. Brent regains consciousness and questions what happened. The Scotsman attributes Brent's fainting to the beast's foul odor and shows him sandal prints on the ground, believing that they were left by Jack. However, Brent denies ever wearing sandals. Following the prints, they arrive at Hex Bucket, a less than reputable port town. Brent is skeptical that Jack would visit such a place, especially after witnessing the town's unsavory merchants peddling their wares. The Scotsman lifts Brent up for all to see and loudly inquires if anyone recognizes him. To their surprise, the patrons in the bar shift their gaze from Brent to an enormous wanted poster of Jack on the wall. They draw their weapons, intent on claiming the bounty on Jack's head. The Scotsman's offer for a peaceful cup of tea is rejected, leading to a brawl. The Scotsman uses his sword to engage the bounty hunters, while Brent hides safely in its sheath. Eventually, he throws a grenade and flees the bar before it explodes. Rolling to a stop in front of an elderly storyteller, the Scotsman is uninterested in hearing a story and places Brent on the ground. The storyteller recognizes Brent as an individual who had previously listened to and enjoyed his tales. The Scotsman quickly queries the storyteller about Jack, but the storyteller replies with Jack's recent visit to the town and his intention to hire a boat for an unknown destination. Although Brent has no recollection of the storyteller or his stories, the Scotsman is determined to pursue the lead and leaves the storyteller without an audience. Their journey leads them to a chart house where they consult a chartman knowledgeable about ocean routes. The Scotsman inquires about the fishman's location, a place known as the Great Unknown, which lies beneath the uncharted waters. Brent expresses reluctance to venture into such treacherous territory, but the Scotsman is undeterred and insists on continuing their quest. They secure passage with a crew of sailors willing to take them to the Great Unknown, although it comes at a steep price. The Scotsman pays with a large gold ingot, and they set sail for their next destination. Going straight into the second part of the Scotsman Saves Jack, the Scotsman and Brent embark on their risky voyage to the Great Unknown. And upon reaching the eerie calm waters, the ship's captain expresses concern, so Brent decides to lighten the mood by serving drinks to the crew. As the ship sails into a dense fog, a mysterious singing voice captivates everyone except the Scotsman. <laughs> Hypnotized, the crew steers towards the singing source, an island with a head-shaped mountain surrounded by shipwrecks. Unnoticed, the ship runs aground, and passengers disembark with tribute in hand, walking towards the singing. The Scotsman follows them into a cavern filled with treasure, discovering the sirens behind the enchanting song. Their enslaved thralls include Vikings, pirates, naval officers, cruise employees, and robots. The Scotsman confronts the sirens, demanding to know what they did to Jack's mind. They reveal they wiped his memory and turned him into a wandering fool while keeping his G and sword as trophies. Enraged, the Scotsman attacks the sirens with his gun leg and grenades, but they prove elusive. The Scotsman tries to snap them out of it, asking them to drown out the siren song, before realizing his bagpipes can break the spell, so he plays deafening music. Everyone, including the sirens, covers their ears. The Scotsman plans works partially, freeing the men. The sirens merge into a three-headed serpent, coiling around the Scotsman. Brent, now realizing his true identity as Samurai Jack, saves the Scotsman by beheading the serpent. Relieved to be back to his old self, Jack thanks the Scotsman. They recount their adventure, but Jack doesn't remember his time as Brent. Their spirits wane when they discover that all ships have left, but they find a rowboat and decide to row back. Playful contests arise, with Jack winning each time. They finally return to the mainland as friends, their rivalry now filled with camaraderie and mutual respect. It's that time again, folks. The final episode, well, the final relevant episode, is called Young Jack in Africa, and it unfolds with Jack's second ever teacher taking Young Jack to an African village to continue his training to one day battle and defeat Aku. 
When Jack arrives at the African village, the village chief says Jack is truly the emperor's son because he looks just like him. Hearing that makes Jack lean his head down in sadness. The chief comments that he knows that Jack's presence at the village means that Aku has returned, and that Jack is now the world's only hope against Aku. During Jack's first night at the African village, the village chief tells Jack about how Jack's father gathered the leaders of all the great tribes of the world and devised a plan to have Aku defeated and destroyed if Aku were to return, and the samurai lord was unable to stop Aku. The village chief tells Jack that he is the only one who can wield the samurai lord's magic sword, meaning Jack is the only one who can defeat Aku now. During his time training, Jack develops a friendship with the village chief's son. One night, another village attacks, searching for Jack. Jack manages to hide, but the other villagers are captured. Jack follows the attackers back to their own village. Jack spots the captured villagers and smiles at seeing that they haven't been hurt. Jack then notices the attackers sitting around a fire. The attacker's chief creates a fire image of Aku and says the great evil spirit has promised them great treasure if they deliver Jack. Jack notices a guard coming by and hides in one of the houses when he notices one of the weapons that the attackers used. Jack decides to practice using the weapon so he can save his friends from the attackers. After Jack finishes practicing with the weapon, he decides he is ready to save his friends. After a somewhat tough battle, Jack defeats the attackers and saves his friends. The village chief, impressed by what Jack did, tells him that his training with them is complete. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the end of Samurai Jack as we knew it way back in 2004. The creators of the show were asked to either end it with a final episode or make a TV movie to close the curtain on the show. And the creators chose... neither? They did intend to make a movie, but the logistics were too complicated, and eventually the process fell apart. But not forever. In 2017, on a different cartoon channel, Adult Swim, a brand new series of Samurai Jack was released. However, it's not quite like the Samurai Jack we know and love. It's set 50 years after Jack was originally plummeted into the future, and basically a new show entirely, using much more mature themes, and according to many hardcore fans, not having the charm that the show had during its original run. But of course, I'll give you a quick recap of Series 5. In the opening of Samurai Jack Season 5, Jack is still battling Aku's forces, but has lost his magical katana, the only weapon capable of killing Aku. He is also trapped in the future as Aku has destroyed all the time portals. Jack is haunted by his past and feels lost and hopeless. Facing the daughters of Aku, a cult intent on killing him, he ends up defeating all but one, Ashi. They are swallowed by a monster but end up working together. Jack and Ashi have adventures including fighting monsters and defeating Ashi's evil mother. Eventually, falling in love, Aku tracks down Jack but doesn't know he has reclaimed his sword. Aku possesses Ashi, making it difficult for Jack to fight back. A climactic battle ensues in the Samurai Jack Season 5 finale, where Jack is almost executed by Aku. However, all the people Jack has helped throughout his 50-year quest, including the Scotsman and his daughters, rise up to aid him. Ashi overcomes Aku's control through the power of love, and they travel back in time to defeat the weaker past Aku. The series concludes with Jack and Ashi preparing to marry, but Ashi suddenly faints. She reveals that her existence is tied to Aku's, and with his defeat, she begins to vanish. Heartbroken, Jack is left alone in a field where a ladybug lands on his arm, reminding him of his beloved Ashi. Now that is a full recap of Samurai Jack. I hope you've enjoyed our journey back from the past through to the future as much as I have, and of course, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends, all that good stuff. And let us know down below what show you'd like to see next. See you all next time!